Welcome to another episode of the Dynamic Thriving Podcast. I am your host, Marianne Pack, spiritual medium, author and publisher, and joy advocate, guiding you into all things life transformational. And this is the Unmuted Voices series for the podcast. And um, it's all about people sharing how they, they have been muted in the past. And I don't just mean a physical voice. When we talk about unmuting our voice, we're talking about not even, of course, speaking with our voice is one part of it, but it's just expressing life. It's expressing who we are. And um, sometimes that can really be squelched and pushed down and um, we live small. And so finding their voices now my guests are sharing how they did that and to share hope with you that you too, as they have been able to unmute their voice, you too have that possibility. So my special guest today is Ryan Hall, and I am so happy to have you, Ryan, on the show today for Unmuted Voices. I'm, I'm honored to be here. I'm honored for the invitation, and I'm honored to be able to speak a little bit about just what it means to really uncover a really a world rattling voice that lies, I think, inside all of us. Yes, absolutely. Yes, we all have something to share. It's all important. And when we, you know, mute our voice like that, other people don't get the benefit of who we are, who we really are. And um, so I am happy to have Ryan. And we're actually just going to jump right in, Ryan, and get started. So when did you feel like it was unsafe for you to speak up? When did you have to mute your voice? What would the, what was the um, a feeling around having to mute your voice? That is an excellent question. And I think we need to go way back, way <laughs> back to um to really a time frame kind of in the late 80s when I was coming up. Um, and my family, uh, you know, due to no fault of our own, my family kind of around around the time I was like 10 to 13, went through a ton of trauma. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this... That we had some estrangements. We had some um, some real some real big blow ups with my parents. Uh, a lot of you know a lot of fights, mm -hmm. and I grew up a very sensitive kid, and I, I'm still a very sensitive guy. I mean, I I definitely consider myself an empath now that I actually know what that really means. Uh, I mean, I always associated that word with just these light and airy women that always go light all the time. Uh, but we all can be that way. But be that as it may, we went through, we really went through a lot. We went through some some, uh, some tragic deaths. We went through some, some, uh, some real heartbreak around that time. And there was a lot of... Um, there was a lot of time during that period uh, in my childhood when I felt like I had to take care of my parents. Oh, yeah. And because, especially my mom, I mean, um, I like I felt like I had to take care of my parents because I didn't want to like shake the apple cart or upset, you know, or upset things. But I also knew that, you know, like losing my uh, like losing my grandfather, her mother, her, her father, losing my aunt and uncle, her sister, losing a lot of people that really meant so much to us during a short amount of time. She shut down, and I feel like I shut down as well. Mm -hmm. And I really spent a lot of time. Um, I really spent a lot of time really upwards of 22 hours a day in my room playing video games watching tv and just afraid to leave and to be able to speak up and have friends and really have a normal childhood so that was kind of around what ages did you say that was uh really around 10 to about 13 14. gotcha yeah a really formative time yeah 
coming into those teen years, you know, I, I, I could see that. So with your mom shutting down and you kind of following suit and feeling like you had to parent the parents and, um, you know, we, we take them on as indoctrinated beliefs. Um, for me, you know, it was typically around religious beliefs and things like that, 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 um, came in to rule our lives. And so what were some of those indoctrinated beliefs that you either picked up because they were subtle messages, you know, like your mom shutting down kind of thing. So you followed suit or, um, even if they were just talked about, we don't want to do it this way. Um, our family only does it this way. We're these kinds of people. Um, so, you know, they, indoctrination can come from our religion, our society, our family, our culture. You know, what were some of those beliefs that you took on as little Ryan that made you unmute a, a your voice? Another excellent question. And I feel like a lot of the, um, like, I feel like a lot of my indoctrinated beliefs, some of the things that I took on, some of the, uh, some of the, um, some of the things that I took on really were around, uh, I really picked up on that through my family. Mm -hmm. Like, I always, I feel like I always associated, um, like, like a lot of the things that went on in my family with the trauma, with the, you know, with the fights, with the, you know, with, there was, a, there's also a history of substance abuse in my family, mm -hmm. but all, like, I always thought this stuff was normal. Like, I always thought this stuff was, you know, all families did it. All families had you know, 2 a.m. fights with one thin wall separating me trying to sleep from the fight. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I always, I always thought this stuff was normal. I always thought that, you know, drinking beer at 10 o'clock in the morning was normal. I just thought this stuff was normal. And it, um, I never wanted to, like, I never wanted to shake that up. I never wanted to cause any trouble. I, I, like, I just wanted to blend in and hide. Like, I wanted to hide, like, I wanted to blend in with the walls, you know? Like, I wanted to blend in with the walls and, you know, just kind of shut down. Mm -hmm. I would, yeah, I would think that would really create such. And that's the thing. There's so many times that we take on these indoctrinated beliefs and we think they're normal. We think that everybody lives that way. So we don't question it. We just, you know, go along to get along and let's fly under the radar. So nobody picks a fight with us, you know? Yeah. Or if you stirred up something, then you'd cause another fight. And then you'd think you were the problem. I could see how that... It uh, yeah, yeah, it was a total like ripple effect like that. It, it was a total ripple effect like that because if I were to start something like it, at least this is how you know this is how little Ryan believed mm -hmm. um, that if I were to start something, if I were to start trouble, if I were to be a rebel in any like in any way whatsoever, that I would. Um, that I would take away from something more important, that I would take away from yes. something more, more pressing, more, more worrisome. And it would just, um, it was just something that I couldn't live with. Like my sister, admittedly, she, my sister was more of a rebel than I was. Mm. Um, and there was a little bit more, uh, teenage drama with her than it was with me because I like I ne like I never wanted to be a cause of that. Mm. I never wanted to be a cause of that and I never wanted that ripple effect to be blamed on me. Yeah. I can definitely see that. Yeah, because kids 
tend to take it. It's our fault anyway. It's not, whatever's going on, the tension we feel or the nervousness, we just like, uh, we definitely can take that on as, are we the cause of that? We're, we're the problem. Um, instead of understanding in our little heads that it's not us. It's not about us. It's it's about what the others are living around us. So what, because you had to mute your voice, um, this always, how we live always affects every area of our life, our relationships, our, you know, our health. For me, it was huge health issues. Um, uh, you know, where we choose, you know, college, choices we make about um, as we're leaving the home and that kind of thing. Um, our, our finances, how did that affect maybe your spirituality? If you were into that kind of thing, how did that muting of your voice affect all those areas of your life? Several things come up for me, um, with that. Um, and this is when, when I was getting a little bit older, but, um, but I would, my weight always fluctuates. Mm -hmm. My weight always fluctuates because I can be a bit of an emotional leader. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and this, I know we're kind of jumping around the timeline here, but when I was in my, I think I was like 30, who when she passed but when my mom passed away from uh uh this 2009 um i i ballooned to close to 300 pounds mm. because i was a, a, like a total emotional eater but i was also i don't think i ever had a drinking problem but i was also drinking alcohol every day Mm -hmm. and it was affecting my health, and it even landed me in the hospital for a week after my gallbladder ruptured. Wow. So I've, um, yeah, this is something I've spoken about in books before, but I've got a, you know, tidy little, um, about a 10-inch scar right under my right rib cage that mm -hmm. is a constant reminder with me of just how fortunate I am to be alive. But it, you know, it affects my physical health. It really, it really felt like caused me to be isolated from, uh, and this is stuff that I'm still working through, but caused it, like isolated from relationships, from friendships, from romantic relationships. It took me out of the dating game forever. Um. I feel like it strained relationships with my own family. Mm -hmm. um, and um, like, I really felt like I, like, I really felt like for like so much of my, my teens, really through my twenties, really up until about my mid thirties actually. But um, really through my teens and through my entire 20s that I felt like my voice didn't matter. Like my voice, like the things that I say, that the words that I speak, that the words that I write, I, mean, I was hardly even writing at this point, but the words that I speak and the stories that I share just really didn't matter at that point. Mm -hmm. And it just caused, you know, it just caused me a lot of... Um, it, it caused physical problems, like I said, with my, uh, you know, with my gallbladder situation, but it also caused me problems with relationships and family and, uh, you know, body image and all that kind of stuff. Sure. Yeah, I can. So, and for me, you know, watching my health deteriorate from youth um, for, for many, many years before I, um, started evaluating my beliefs and things, you know, I crashed at 34 just because of the drugs and the surgeries. I always, you know, tease that I'm, I'm surprised my body doesn't rattle when I walk because I have so many parts missing, 
you know, (laughs) because of all the illness that I created. And then to come across when I started looking for something different um, because the medical community just wasn't doing it for me, you know, and then turning to the natural side um, with supplements and nutritionals and things like that, that um, I started, uh, you know, finding books on different kinds of healing modalities. And I found, of course, Louise Hay's book, You Can Heal Heal Your Life, and just was amazed at all the emotional probable causes of all the diseases I had over all those years from childhood up, you know, developing throat and thyroid issues three different times, three different diseases. Um all over, over all those years and, and just being able to go down that list and go, okay, well, that emotion is tied to that indoctrinated belief. That emotion is tied to that. Indoctr- it, and that's exactly wild. what my body responded to. And it said, we can't deal with this. You have to find a different way. No, I, I, I relate to that so closely because mm-hmm. I was on antidepressants mm-hmm. and on uh, blood pressure medication from the time I was like 20 years old. Oh my. I'm no longer on anything right now, but I was on blood pressure medication, high um, antidepressants, different kinds of those mm-hmm. kind of medications from the time I was like 20 years old. And that's just not that that's there's just something there's just something wrong about that. There's just something absolutely wrong and unnatural about that. Because I should be in the prime of my health when I'm in my, you know, when I'm in my, you know, in, in, in my 20s. And I wasn't. I was sick as a dog for most of that time. Mm-hmm. Yep. I I so understand. I know you do. Because the, you know, your body is always listening and feeling your vibration. And if your vibration is screaming, I hate life and I hate my, you know, what's going on and I believe how bad I am and how unworthy and how worthless I am, it is listening and it is responding. And um, even this morning, I posted something about um, my favorite Voltaire quote is, I have chosen to be happy because it is good for my health. You know, Voltaire is like way on back there. Right. You know, that he understood that um, and he didn't have a pie in the sky life. Um, So it's just it is our choice. It and and we have to start being the sovereign of our own life. So, you know, now I want to move into, let's move into when you started realizing some of the aha moments and the awakening that started happening, because sometimes it's a jolt. It for me was crashing at 34. And then, then all the little ahas happened for years then after that. So sometimes it's a big jolt. Sometimes it's just a culmination of Small ahas as you grow and you think and you move forward. So, what were some of those ahas that started happening for you? I love I love this question. Um, one of the things that was really powerful for me, uh, my dad was a musician, oh. um, and he, you know, could play anything with a keyboard, mm. from a Hammond organ to a church pipe organ. I mean. You know, keyboards were his thing. But as he fell into his addiction and his depression and just all that kind of stuff, he 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 got out of that. And I think it was driving him crazy as he got older, especially after mom passed away. And I one of his dream instruments was a Fender Rhodes piano. Now, if you've ever heard the Beatles get back, there's a keyboard break that the late Billy Preston plays in that song. That was a Fender Rhodes piano. 
Um, you know, so many, you know, guys like Donald Fagan from uh, from uh, Steely Dan, Larry Dunn from Earth, Wind and Fire, uh, Stevie Wonder, just a lot of the biggest names out there played one. So dad calls me one day, this was maybe a year or so after mom passed away, said that he found a Rhodes piano, that one of his old friends from high school was looking to get rid of one. And he was so excited. He he drove up to Montgomery, uh, Montgomery, Alabama, picked it up, um, bought a little amp with it, and put it in his uh, in the mudroom of his house. And as he got older, and sicker, and more depressed, and more uh, deeper into his addiction, the dust on that piano almost started to turn the white keys gray. It was bad. Mm -hmm. And I remember a moment, maybe, you know, just a couple of months after dad passed away, late in 2014, that I was over at his house taking care of some, uh, you know, taking care of some bookkeeping things. And I saw that piano. And now I don't, I don't play the piano. I, I'm not a. I, I'm a music connoisseur, but I'm not a. Uh, I, I'm not a musician by any stretch. Because it never really interested me at the you know at the time when when, when I was a kid. Because I would have been a way to express myself. But um, but I remember taking um, like a Swiffer cloth and dusted that piano and I plugged like I plugged it into the amp. This is an electric piano, right? I plugged it into the amp and just plinked out a few notes. And it sounded just like all of those big names that um, you know your Billy Preston, your um, your Stevie Wonder type, those big names. And it sounded just like that piano. And I don't think I was conscious of it at the time, but I realized I can't abide by another dusty piano. Mm -hmm. So I started like I started getting more serious about my writing at that point. I started uh, like I enrolled in a life coach training course. Um, like I started taking my own personal self-development, but also self-expression. I started taking that a lot more serious at that point. I, like, again, I was not conscious at the time when I was doing this, but I knew that was the moment just like looking back on it, I knew that was the moment was like, I can't do this anymore. I can't sit back and just let the world go by when I have so much to say, but I've been sitting on it for years and years and years. Right. Wow. Yeah, that's, it's amazing how sometimes, of course, we don't even know what we're looking at at the time. Sometimes it's, it's, you know, that we have to look back at it and go, oh, there it is. And there it is. And there was a moment and there was a moment. So, um, so like, when did you start? I mean, these aha moments happen, but when did you start putting into action the shifts that you were wanting to make? You know, what did you start doing? What did you, did you have help? Were there people that you, you know, kind of surrounded yourself with to support you? How did that start working out for you to make the shift, start making those shifts of transformation? Well, I teased it in that, in the last answer that I, uh, mm -hmm. that I shared, but um, it was around this time that I started working with a coach for the first time. Mm. Um, when I started working with a life coach for the first time, um, um, her name 
I, I no longer work with her, but her name is Michelle Lakin. And this is a woman who became a very dear friend of mine during some really dark times in my life, but has also become a mentor as I've started practicing my own coaching as well. Right. But I was working with a group of people. We met every Monday morning mm. at 9.30 a.m. And um, dur like during this time, like right after my father passed away, I was just really, an analogy I like to use is I was crawling out of the rubble. I was crawling out of the rubble of a destroyed house, uh, like a destroyed building. And as I started crawling out of this rubble, more rubble started falling on top of me. Because during the... 2015 was one of those years that I'll never forget because that my, my father passed away in uh, December 14 and you know 2015 there was a lot of the state drama there was a lot of just like really figuring out just who I am but this this group of people that I worked with every month uh, every Monday morning, I had been sitting on a manuscript for a book for maybe a year and a half at this point, like a completed manuscript. But I was scared to death to share it with anybody mm -hmm. because I was like unsure of even if this was a good book or not. But I got the encouragement to finish that manuscript. I got the encouragement to get it published. I got the encouragement to start traveling alone. I got the encouragement to move from Alabama up to the New York area. I got the encouragement to join this coach training program. And I think it was all because... I allowed these people into my life. I allowed this group of people into my life. Um, and we really became like family over the course of that year. Um, you know, Michelle, what, one of her greatest strengths as a coach, she kind of, had, she, she comes from, um, from, a, uh, from an improv comedy background. So she's got a great sense of humor, but she knows how to deliver that tough love with a sense of humor where a lot of people, it's almost like a, you know, it's almost like a WWE taking a, you know, taking a steel chair upside the head when it comes to that tough love. She did it with a sense of humor. She did it with a, you know, with a wink, but it really, but it really started to, I think opened me up to just what I was capable of in my writing and in, you know, in my professional life. And I'm still, you know, what is that? Six years later, I'm still figuring, you know, figuring it out. Seven years later, I'm still figuring it out. And I have a feeling I'll still be figuring it out until the day they lower me into the ground. Absolutely. Life is a journey. It's not a destination. And we don't get a certificate that we completed all the lessons. And now from here on, it's clear sailing. It doesn't there's work no, that way, does it? There's no finish line. Come on. <laughs> so I always say our mess is our message. Because whatever we transform through, the mess that we have been working on, and of course, we'll continue to work on but we've made enough progress that we're actually now creating a message of hope for people. So oh, okay. what okay. our message, our message. Yes. Yes. Our mess is our message. So what now, because you went through the mess, what is your message? How are you serving the world? How are you, you know, making an impact with, with what you've now, how are you unmuting your voice? to send that message out. 
several ways. The biggest, the biggest way is that, um, is that I have recently completed the manuscript of my third book. Ooh. <laughs> uh, my third book, which is a memoir, ironically enough, about how I have unmuted my own voice. Uh, the title is Mining for My Voice. And it's, as I like to say, it's the stories of, it's the stories of the events that have, that led me to silence my voice, but also the events, the people and the creatures that I have, that I have met along the way that has helped me to uncover my own voice and my own message and my own, uh, and in my own journey. So, um, so I'm looking to get that out this fall. So, uh, you know, be on the lookout for that. I've got a few, um, you know, I've got a few test readers out. I've got, um, uh, I've got a, a, a former uh, coach of mine, mentor of mine, who has um, who is pinning a forward for it. So I'm really excited about that. I haven't gotten that yet, but um, uh, I'm really excited about that. But that joins the the two novels, Hello Again and Written in the Stone, that I have uh, that I have published. Um, and I've also been a part of uh, uh, of a couple of uh, collaborative books um, that our friends, our mutual friends at Greenheart Living, have put out. Mm -hmm. um, but I have also um, I have also a couple of published titles of my own that I have a uh, I have a business where I have. Um, edited and published a few books. Mm -hmm. um, one was a, a recovery memoir that sold incredibly well, uh, a, rec a, a recovery from alcoholism a memoir that has sold incredibly well. Another is a, just a wickedly funny children's book satire. And um, I'm in the process of two more titles. One is a little sleep guide and another that I'm about to that that I'm about to start working on is a children's book that is about as smart and funny as anything I've ever read. So um, so I'm helping people find their voice through their own story, through their own um, through their own um, uh, journey through writing because. Everybody can be a writer. Mm -hmm. Just going from, and you know this as well as I do, everybody can be a writer because if you've written an email, if you've written a text message, you can be a writer. But mm -hmm. it takes uncovering a lot of stuff to go from being a writer to being an author. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, so, um, so I have, um, I'm spreading that. I also too have a podcast. It's been a bit. Of, it, it's mm -hmm. uh, it's been on a bit of um, uh, hiatus as of late, but I am looking to get it back up as we're about to uh, we're about to cross over um, 100 episodes uh, ourselves. Mm -hmm. So I'm excited about that. Uh, it's called Solar Powered S O U L dash R. But I love speaking about stories from my own life, but also speaking to people who have overcome things in their life to share their story, to find their voice and to um, just create like to find their message, to create their message through their own mess. If I could mm -hmm. borrow your phrase there. Absolutely. Yeah. So like I have a firm belief that everybody has a world rattling humanity shaking voice. Mm -hmm. You just have to uncover a lot of rubble, get out of a lot of rubble to find it. Yes. Yes. And I usually describe it as, you know, peeling back the layers that we got covered over. Our little pure little hearts, our little perfect selves got indoctrinated and put on and, and, and we're just 
finally peeling those layers back, you know, to, to coming into our own and blossoming, being our own sovereign. So are you life coaching also a writer's I, coaching? Okay. I, I am. Yes, I am. I am primarily, I do focus on writing and storytelling coaching. That's mm -hmm. what most of my clients are. Uh, but I have done some, uh, done some life coaching in the past um, and definitely, uh, definitely am open to uh, working with people uh, mm -hmm. going forward. Awesome. And you can get a hold of Ryan through his email, royalheartscoaching at gmail.com. So I'll leave that up and it'll also be in the show notes. Um, so, so you've unmuted your voice. You're now podcasting. You've been podcasting for a while. Um, you help people with publishing, writing and publishing their books. You have your own books. You know, you wholly believe that everyone's voice, like you said, kind of a earth rattling voice, a message that, that needs to be heard. So I just commend you and um, am so thankful that you have vulnerably shared these stories. And I'm so looking forward to your book. Your upcoming book is called Mining for My Voice. Mining for my voice. So be sure and um, connect with Ryan and uh, through this email because um, uh, I've watched his books come out. I've gotten his books. So make sure that that you follow Ryan. Um, I'm sure you can connect and then also follow him on social media. And um, I want to thank everybody for joining us today on the Dynamic Thriving Podcast and listening to stories about unmuted voices. Um, you're welcome and invited to visit our website, wearejoybooks.com. And um, for all of the books that we have in the We Are Joy book series and other books that, that we have published that are outside that series. Um, so we would love to have you visit there. Please comment, like, and share this podcast because it helps my work go around the world and create more joy and love. And Ryan, do you have any parting words of wisdom you would like to leave us with? I Yes, I do. As I said before, everybody, it doesn't matter who you are, everybody has that world rattling, humanity shaking voice. Do you do you want to share that voice to be an author, to be a speaker, to be a podcast? Mm -hmm. None of that stuff really matters. Like the like the the medium really doesn't matter right. because you can find your voice to to be a better leader in your company, to be a better leader as a parent, to be a better leader in your church, in your school. You can find your voice. You can uncover that world rattling voice because so often I feel like we put our authentic selves in mothballs. We put dreams in mothballs. We put our lives in mothballs. You know, an analogy I like to use is um, have you put your dream in a moth in, in mothballs? Have you kept your um, when was the last time you put new strings on your guitar? When was the last time you bought paint? When was the last time you found it in you to share that story? Mm. You may have to you may have to uncover a lot of stuff. You may have to uncover a lot of rubble. But there are people like Marianne, like myself, like a lot of people that we know that would love nothing more than to help you uncover that. So that's my parting message to y'all here today. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Ryan. I appreciate oh, you. I appreciate your life and the growth that you have displayed before me as I have been friends with you for a little while now and, and watching your work and watching the, the evolution that's becoming more Ryan-like. So thanks, everyone. Remember, you are joy looking for a way to express. And unmute that voice so that that joy can be expressed. We love you all. Thank you, Ian. Thank you. Thank you.